Pine Harris Planning and Zoning Board work session meeting. The time is now 4.01 and I'd like to call it to order. My name is Jeremy Hooper and I'll be serving as your chair tonight. Um, I'll point out that currently we have five board members present with a sixth one on the way. Um, however, we will not be um, performing any, approving any business tonight. Um, Howard, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves beginning on my right. Paul Roberts. Jules Latham. Jack Farrell. Matt Jones. Welcome, Matt. And I'll point out that um, we have Alfred Cassidy, Darren Birch, and Alex Cameron with um, Village staff with us this evening. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to agenda item one. We're going to do going to discuss village place form based codes. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for arriving today. Um, tonight's going to be it may be a shorter session because I thought we we might I thought we were going to be able to start on Piner South, but last week kind of threw us off just a little bit. The good news is that we are almost through the entire form based code for Village Place. So once we finish up the signage and really the and go over some of the definitions. Then what my, my intent to do is all the, all the adjustments that we've made over the course of the last couple months, I'm going to put that into a final document. Hopefully, we'll be able to look at that, the entire file, final document on, on that first meeting in January. And then we can start making, actually go start to, I'll take it to council, and we'll start to work on the, the ordinance changes. So um, that's where we are with the form-based code for Village Place. Uh, we should be starting on Piner South relatively soon I was we were working on the regulating plan um, but we made some adjustments to the regulating plan and so we want to make some some adjustments before we start working on that and that regulating plan is probably between the regulating plan and the site design standards those are the two those are really the two most important parts of the document the rest are kind of guidelines the architectural uh, the architectural guidelines are important as well to kind of create that character so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about we're going to talk about signage uh, section six signage chapter. We're going to go over the definitions. We're not going to go in depth on any of them. Just to say, just to go over briefly what's in the definitions chapter. And the other thing that we've been working on that we'll t that we'll, that we want to revisit would be the regulating plan. Uh, we made some adjustments to the regulating plan based on the last comment. So we just before we finalize this, I just want to. Have your eyes take a look at it because we did make some changes to the regulating plan based on some of our last meetings. So with that, uh, let's start out with the signage section. And, and before we actually get into the signage section, because signage, we do have some references to private signage. The, this signage section is really relates a lot to public wayfinding, street banners, things like that, which are all under our control. Uh, but there are some references to actually private signage in here that, that will carry over when we actually create the overlay. So what I want to do is I want to start with Chapter 5, the architectural uh, section, and just go over some of the sign reference, sign cross-references in there. And that would be the last page of that signage design section that you guys have. It was attached to the end. So it should start out with... The top, the top of that should say com uh, commercial mixed use building types. And there's a couple of things on, on signage that I just want to go over here because it relates to the overall signage, uh, uh, overall signage uh, regulations. So I'm going to just start off with uh, up in the upper, upper left hand column, column number one. Section number two signs shall be uh, wood, simulated wood, fiberglass, acrylic, ca cast plastic, aluminum and enameled steel. So that would be the, the when we do the actual uh, ordinance update, those would be the allowed material types for signage uh, on, a store, on, on a storefront. Then we go down to uh, number one right here uh, under configurations and techniques. The storefront doors, awnings, and signage shall be of unified design to establish an architectural language for the base of the building facade. Also see urban design criteria. What you're going to see also back in section six is we don't want uniform signage throughout the district, but on a building itself, you want relatively uniform sign signage on that building. Julia, you having trouble finding this? Last page, the very last page of the, yes. That's cur what? correct. We're actually in, we're in the form-based code document. I'm sorry. I should have started you there. Uh, so... Okay, so we go down to number seven. 
and that is individual retail or office signage is encouraged to create visual interest for the pedestrians. I don't, that's tough for us to really codify, but it's, you know, want to create some visual interest for the people who are walking down the street, because when, when the building signage is really meant to, the way, the way it's set up is meant to, you know, be interesting for the pedestrian, not the car moving by. Something like that. So a lot of a lot of the rules that you see, what we're proposing, really are to create those signage. Some that have some depth, some interesting, some interesting looks. We're actually proposing to to prohibit uh, wall uh, box cabinet signage, things like that, in favor of individual, individually cast signs, things, lettering, pin letters, or pin, pin lettering, uh, things like that. Eight, uh, and this is where we, this is where we also have some additional. References in the back. Eight is a single external, this is a blade sign, may be applied flush with the elevation above the ground floor level. The sign shall be a maximum of 24 inches in height uh, by a length proportional. Oh, no, this is the wall sign. Sorry, the blade sign's coming up. Uh, uh, 24 inches in height by a length proportional to the storefront opening width. What we're going to do is our code is relatively, the, the existing PDO is relatively limiting in signage. So from an from a overall square footage standpoint, I think we'll defer to that. But the, with the respect to the sign types, wall sign and blade sign, those are where the, where the form-based code would be, more, would be more restrictive. It's hard to write a code that would actually... I understand uh, the whole proportional thing, but it would be hard. I, well, I guess we could look into it, but I don't know how we would actually codify that in the PDO. You'd have to codify it somehow based on the length of it. I don't, I don't even know what that calculation would be. I don't know if I've seen that calculation. So we'll, we'll, we defer to, pardon me? Get a ratio. A ratio? Uh, there's too much engineering in that for me, Matt. <laughs> I think we'd defer. Now you have it. I think we defer back to back to our PDO requirements, which are relatively strict. Uh, number nine. So you can see when we start to talk about signage, the last one, we're talking about the signs that are right here in this kind of the sign band. We talked a little bit about it. when we get to definitions. I want to. I, I do actually want to add a add a uh, definition called signable area, and uh, where the, we'd have an actual, actual definition of what constitutes a signable area, which is really those things that aren't covering up an architectural feature, a column, something like that. This is what what a lot of what a lot of uh, codes call to is the sign band. So this would be that sign band where where you would put a wall, some type of wall sign. Uh, you can see it's individual channel letters that it's lit by. Uh, there's gooseneck, so we talk a little bit about gooseneck neck lighting in the signage section. Or these could be backlit with some type of with some type of lighting behind it. So this would be where your wall sign would go, and then the next sign that we talk about is number nine, which is additionally a single external blade sign may be hung below the second floor window sill good lord perpendicular to the building. These signs may be, may extend from the building a maximum of forty to two inches out and be a maximum of twenty four inches in height. So now a, play, a blade sign is also known as a projecting sign. So that is what we're talking about is right here. You don't want them to get too high, so we're going to have another, uh, I think, Alex, is there a current code on how high a blade sign can be? So uh, there's, so if you got, so the, the, you want a blade sign that's a little bit closer to the street. You don't want it up so high that, again, this is all devoted for the pedestrian. So when we're looking at a, a blade side like this, you want to maximize the height, and you really don't want to get up here into the second level very high, so you want to max out the height. And I think there's a, we don't have a maximum height right here in this section, but I made a note in the signer section that says that we don't want it more than 24 feet. So we're going to, what we're going to do is codify how high this sign can actually be. So it's going to be somewhere between 18 to 24, and a lot of, and a lot of the codes I say, you see, they can be below that second floor sill, which would be right about here. Darren, as you go through this, mm -hmm. to what ex can you point out to what extent there <clears throat> these standards or whatever are significantly different from our current sign requirements in the PDO? That's where I refer back to <laughs> Alex. What's what? So, so a wall a wall sign in the VC district. What's the wall? What 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 is the what is? Well, you have it right over there. In the PDO sign uh, section is confusing. It, not confusing. It's um, thorough. I think it'd be the way to put it. Um, <laughs> and 
point of uh, requires incredible study to understand it. it so maybe you can summarize where this would be different or not different. That's a good point. So a wall sign. Let's get back to this one. So a, a regular wall sign, which is you have two main, really two main, main types of signage in addition to the window signs and the blinking open signs on buildings downtown, which we'll handle. Um, you have, you have well, two, two to three different types of signs. You have the wall sign, which is kind of your main sign. You sometimes have an awning sign. You'll see some awning signs, some signs attached to awnings in, in, the, in the downtown area or, or all around elsewhere. And then you have blade type signs. We currently prohibit roof signs. So you're not going to see any roof signs. And we're not promoting any type of ground, ground type signs uh, on the development. So Alex, for a wall sign. So if we're talking about a wall sign in the VC district, so remember everything that we've kind of character we, we've designed this area for relates somewhat to the VC district. So in the VC district, what, what what's the wall sign uh, square footage? Six. So a maximum of six square feet right now. Oh, I didn't see any square footage calculations in here. You so. didn't. You didn't because what we say is we refer back to the P. If you, okay. The sign section refers back to the PDO. Oh, consistent for number. with the PDO. Yes, okay. That is correct. These form-based codes can override and or replace the PDO where, where appropriate. Is that That's correct? correct. That would be correct. So if, if, we, if we, so right now we have that code that says six square feet. If we think six square feet is too small, if we think it's too big, we can, we can, always, we can always adjust that number up or down. Okay. And then recognizing that a substantial part of Village Place that we're talking about will be in or is in the historic district, or Preservation Commission will look at each of these buildings and its frontage and its signage and so forth to see whether that's appropriate. So there's another level of checks and balances in here. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, I have sort of two questions. One is um, non-conforming uses. I mean, do they have to... I, mean, there, I assume there are signs now that are not conforming to this. Uh, yes, there are non-conforming signs, and we have rules specific to non-conforming signs. So, do they have to come in compliance, or only if only when they change hands, or, or what's the deal? Not or, or if the only other option is if they become disfigured or or if they to, want to, to replace a point, them, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if a new business comes in, then they'd have to totally conform. Okay, my other question is about particularly second story offices, um, are they permitted to have, say, they're not, you know, it's not 12 panes, but it's two panes or whatever. Mainly it would be attorneys or, yeah. you know, can they have the gold lettering with black around it or something like that on the window, which does occur? here and especially it actually is appropriate in the village because old time places would have signs like that. Alex? Yes. If, if it met the other dimensional criteria. What is it 20 is it 20 percent on yeah, something like 20 percent maximum for door and window type signs are kind of lumped together. Yeah I'm talking about a plastic sign or something like that. I, I'm talking about a. You're, you're talking about something that's stenciled onto the window. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. And, and they have to be, there's a requirement that they have to be uh, professionally etched or, or whatnot into the windows and doors as well. I can't, do we have, a, we do have some second floor office uses. Do, does anybody have signs up sitting up? I don't recall yeah. ever seeing one. I'm sure that there may be one, but. Uh, a lot of times they're in the entrance, right? They're, they're sitting at a plaque on the ground entrance. Ground floor. Coming yeah. in the ground floor. <clears throat> and I think we talk about that on number 10. We say, uh, if we go down to number 10, Luis, were you done? I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. You good, Luis? Are we good? Okay. Um, there we go. So number 10, we say signs may contain, may contain multiple individual signs which refer to tenants in the building. So that really becomes a multi-tenant a multi -tenant sign. And I think we need to, we might need to get a little bit more expansive on that. Because the, the question would be, if you have an overall sign right here, you can't, I don't, I don't think you can really effectively put a multi-tenant sign in that sign band based on six square footage, six square feet of, of footage. So I'm just making a note to see if we make, need to make it, need to look into that a little bit more. 
Uh, number 11 would be signs shall be externally lit with decorative visible light sources. Pin letters with concealed halo backlighting are also uh, permitted. So if you look at this, this would be an, exter an example of an external light type, the, the historic gooseneck type lights. So that, that, is kind of, that is encouraged. Or if, if this was an individual channel letter, having something, something backlit with a halo, uh, which is kind of subtle. Any questions on that? All right, number 12 would be, and this is where we're getting down into the, into the awning section. And you can see we have some regulations on awnings being proposed right here. Uh, fabric awnings may have side panels, but shall have, not have a, a bottom soffit panel. That's, that, that's the soffit that encloses the, the awning on the underside of it, because that's not historically, as far as I know, that's not accurate. And I don't think we have any, we don't have any enclosed awnings downtown, do we? We do in in the, in the village center. We have some enclosed awnings on the underside. Oh, under enclosed? No, I know what you oh, mean. I didn't mean that. I thought you meant the side uh, side flange or yeah. what it was mm -hmm. called. Yeah. So what? what this, this doesn't show that, by the way. Doesn't show what? It doesn't indicate that uh, you know you have the awning and then you have a what's the right word? A small flap, a six eight inch. Uh, the drip. Oh. Kind of like the drip line. It is showing it. It. it, it you can see it. You can see the, uh, if you look right here, Jack, right here. Okay. Can you zoom that in just a little bit? I see the little, yep. You're asking me to, you're really asking me to do this, right? And that, sure. and that quite often <laughs> is signed or has I can't. the business on it, and there's examples. Yes, you're, you're, you're right. So if you look at it, we, we're, the, the, the proposed regulation would be fabric awnings may have side, side panels, but shall not have a bottom soffit panel. The vertical drip of an awning may be stenciled with signage a maximum of eight inches in height, and awning shall not be backlit. So if you think of it, I think uh, like the drum and quill comes to mind. I think they have, the, the name is actually on the sill. Do? Yeah. yeah. So now, is, is that or is that consistent with this? That that is consistent with this with that particular number twelve. So that'd be consistent with that. It's probably consistent with their existing rules, right, Alex? Well, that that <clears throat> that's consistent with the historic district standards that, that requires it. That's the only place signage can be located. On I recall awnings. that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you think of it, the community I came from. Until we changed that rule, that we used to have they used to have signage that because it was a larger area, they'd splash it across this top panel, and it was just. It, it wasn't historically correct, but it was just a, a way that we that they could add additional signage in addition to their wall signage. So we had to we had to put a, the brakes on that. The the lighting standard there about that that awning shall not be internally lit too. That's also consistent with the current language in the PDO. And then uh, number fourteen, which is. Signs flush with the facade shall be designed to be in integral with the building, a maximum of 24 inches in height and externally lit. So that's is that that's pretty that's pretty uh, consistent with our own code, right? But we do allow for box signs right now, correct? Except in the his, except in the historic district. Unless it's appropriate. Unless it's, unless it's appropriate. How is that different from number eight? Looks, it does look the same, doesn't it? Yeah, looks like we can actually get rid of that. They're both flush with the elevator. Yeah, yeah so they look, they look, it looks alike unless that unless the word integral throws it off. Well, and then the lighting specification is in twelve, but not, or excuse me, is in thirteen, but not eight. No, no. Uh, sorry, fourteen, but not eight. Point. All right. We'll, we'll make. We'll, what we'll do is collapse that into one. All right. So, any other questions? Uh, are you going to leave before you leave that page? Can mm -hmm. I ask a question? Sure. In the upper right, uh, barely off the screen, there, you're showing the. Uh, and this has nothing to do with signs, but uh, the setback for the door. The recessed doors, right, right here. Uh, it seems to me that in the text it says 30 inches, but on the drawing it says three feet.
in my eyes aren't good enough right now, but uh, I did it with a good point. You're right. <laughs> that's a good point. Let me. That's a good catch. And, and another question, and it has to do with um, the beginning here. We talk about construction materials, and it talks to storefront exterior walls, and it lists the type of uh, materials. Mm -hmm. It lists aluminum. I have a question about that. Are you indicating that aluminum siding is okay as an exterior wall material? And by the way, on the next page, or following pages, commercial use mixed building types, it also talks to exterior walls. Um, and I didn't see um, aluminum what, where's on Where's that, Jack? Where's it? Um, you're looking at which? Uh, the exterior wall is the first uh, paragraph. Okay. That one doesn't have aluminum in it. So when we were, we must have. Question whether aluminum would be appropriate, uh, uh, and, and it's inconsistent, by the way, between that page description of the storefront exterior walls and then the exterior walls on the commercial mixed use building types. No, you're right. What what happened is when we were making some edits to this, we we. Oh, it we, happened, but the question is. Uh, we took out. We it looks like we took out aluminum. I'm assuming. I think we did. That we took out aluminum and we didn't take it out of this next, out of the first one. So let, let me look into that because I don't. You know, when we were looking at this, aluminum is also specified a couple more times down there. I'm going to do. We'll do a, a word search of aluminum in the document to see where that shows up. A lot of little things. We'll probably when we get it all together, we'll be able to. And, and really, it's the architectural standards where you have a lot of this. Because remember when we had that two and a half hour session going, trying to go over the, the architectural standards. Which, by the way, I've, I, I've some of the there. I've talked to some of the some local people who are in development. They've looked at the, the architectural standards, and they they think they're relatively feasible. Good. They Good. said it looks like a lot of heavy lifting was done to get there, but they look fees. They look like they're they're doable. So I'm waiting to get some comments back on that just to see see what the, what that might look like. But these guidelines, like you know, we didn't just make up the guidelines were somewhat <clears throat> taken from another you know from other codes like we, yeah. like we do. So um, okay, so while I'm nitpicking here, <laughs> on the you uh, just have one page, two pages of nitpick on this. <laughs> on the, the next page, uh, my only my last nitpick um, under techniques uh, number do. three. Okay. Um, talks to um, wood, clapboard, wood beaded siding, uh, or... Uh, Dimensors. Yeah, it's a smooth finish. I question smooth finish. A lot of simulated wood that's not smooth. I don't know. Alex, I mean, you and I and Kathy sat and we, we sat and looked at the standards, and I think that these were one of the ones that... I think we we made some adjustment too, based on some of the because I think you guys had been looking at it from a historic standard. No, I, I don't think the historic standards are probably that descript. Just right. as far these as are the more descript in, in a lot of places yeah. than our historic standards. I, I think the idea about that was I don't think we had a strong feeling either way. But the smooth finish is okay if you've got a substitute material that's meant to resemble wood. If, if that's your whole thing, is you're, if you're looking from the sidewalk, you probably wouldn't really know the difference other than you know no one's doing it, wood it siding anymore. It has a anymore. green texture. It, it, it can, um, but the, the, the substitute material. But the thought is if you're actually using real wood, then by the time it's been painted, it's lost that Not grainy lost texture. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I think, that was, I think that's the intent of it. I'm, I'm sure it'll work out fine. I just, I just point that out because it stood out to me. A lot of the plastic boards have two sides. One's a wood grain, the other one's smooth. You just flip them for whatever you want. Yeah, I, I don't think we want to run into any unintended consequences of not having the ability to get something that's a substitute material that is solely smooth. It's all shows or, or fills of the grain. But so do, we need, do we need to adjust that? That's that sentence on if smooth finish. If you're comfortable finish? that you don't need to address it, I'm fine. I just it just I, hit me as 
I think maybe that's a question that if we could get someone in the industry to kind of help us out to see just how feasible that really is or what is an exterior smooth surface yeah really okay. okay okay even some if we could get to a point where we could get our hands on actual product samples that would or you know field trips or elsewhere just to really see and feel what that's like because right now we're all just kind of in a bubble thinking about it I prefer the nitpicking, so I really do. I, we, these are li these little things can hang you up. When Devils in the details. Uh, exactly. Right. So if, if there's anything else that, as we're going through this, Matt, um, <laughs> <laughs> we we potentially need to adjust. Let's let's do it. Oh, this is the, this is the best time to do it. His technique is he waits until the end, and then he gives you three or four pages. Okay, so Darren, I have a comment. <laughs> I do actually have a comment on right. what you said about the height of the signs on the building. We're mm -hmm. talking about the blade sign, but mm -hmm. I'm assuming that you're also going to add something about the like building mounted signs. The wall the sign height. right here where it's showing kind of in, I mean, the, the intent, we've got to make sure that the intent is here is that the, the wall signage really should go in that, that sign band between the first and the second floor. Right. That's the intent of where it should be. It should be just it's under the floor level here. And, and what's that, there's a dimension there that's called out of what, two foot? I think I can't I can't zoom in on this. But right now, there's nothing to prohibit somebody from meeting the dimension size, but putting it. It could be know, six feet tall and only one foot. It wide. could be above the second story window, I, if you don't have a max. It just building yeah. Height. The, the base requirements that we have in play now just say it's it shall good. not extend past the roof line. Yeah, 24 inches. So you could have. You know, think of think of the theater signs, the old theater signs that are up and down, projecting off a building, something like that. I think you know. We do prohibit those, but we do, we do, <laughs> but we do, we do really max. We we max. I mean that that six square feet is not a heck of a lot of, yeah. so we really are pretty restrictive on that. But well, now, now we're going to focus that restriction into, or proposing to focus that restriction into this area. Really is what what we're doing. That that's what I'm. I mean, more than height, I guess I mean elevation, like a restricting the elevation along the building. The height of it. Yeah, and and that's <laughs> the that's the twenty four inch right. That's uh that's the. Yep. 14 and 8 where they get at is that it yeah you don't want it you you don't want it to get really greater than 24 inches in height you really don't want it to get it if you it, oh okay the placement okay. positional not okay yeah gotcha. you're talking positional and not, what, not the sign okay and what and what we're what we're going to try and define is this allowable signage area between the first between the first and second floors we're showing here okay. oh, so we need to look at that I thought the PDO, I thought I read somewhere that it did recommend that. PDO or? It, it could be something as simple. It must be a minimum of X, Y, Z from the bottom glazing or with the second floor. We, I've we, I, we, I written, I written, written a code where it was a maximum of 18, 18 feet or below the uh, below the second floor, second yeah. story. I mean, I'm, I was just showing Jack, I pulled up an image of the front of the manor, uh -huh. and you'll recall that we granted a variance for that sign, so the lettering would be proportionate with the building, and it looks quite nice. But if that lettering, instead of being right at the top of that portico, had been, say, between the first and third row of windows, it would, look it would be awful. And it's no longer pedestrian-oriented at that point, because you're eyes are being taken off the street level yeah. so the higher you get up on a building that's meant to be seen from a from a far from from far away closer to the street level you want it at the first floor something lower so people walk in below but i i, I well and, and agree. even even with the manor being so far set back from the road it's 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 not really an issue of it needing to be pedestrian relevant because we, from the road you can see the whole expanse okay. of the building very easily it just looks wrong to have it elsewhere. It, it I agree. looks like a billboard. And that's why they call. And that's why the, these areas were specifically, in the in the olden days, they were specifically designed for for signage. And so that's that that was the area that was meant to, meant to be signage. Now think about it. Think about if you're coming up Carolina Vista, and you're looking at the hotel, and you're seeing a big sign way up on the third floor. Well, you could see it from probably coming down in in, in from uh, uh, Tuda or. What's the road? 
What is a road at that circle? Well, down, down by the circle, can you imagine having a big sign sitting up? You, you could pro probably see a lighted sign sitting right below the roof line coming in, but that wouldn't be the most appropriate because it would, it, would, it would detract architecturally from, from that building, although you could certainly find it. So I think the intent with all the signage here is it's more pedestrian level. It's at the, it's at the street level. It's at the pedestrian level. Are we, can I ask this, are we explicit about um, prohibiting neon? Got to be in our, we have a color palette. I mean, you know, sometimes it's appropriate in certain areas, but because it, it actually is historic in some areas, not here. But um, <laughs> I didn't Flash see a reference to it, so they can't use that right. The other thing I was, are we going to be explicit about it? Because I really think it's a good idea. This Second thing is, what about traditional window signs for real estate companies and the like in the windows? You mean like a for sale, a for sale sign? Well, I guess if you walk, walk through the village, you see every one of the um, real estate agents, which well, I think oh, is list. appropriate, but I don't want them to not be able to do that when there's... You know, they have all their windows posted with 20%. different homes and things like that. Oh. Okay. Well, what do we consider we, we, them? We, so Outside of the meeting. <laughs> same thing with restaurants. You mean like a, like a menu board? Yeah. Yeah. Here's our featured listings, in other words. Yeah, we, yeah, Jack knows the history on that one. I don't know. I'm just curious about it because it gets out of control and some places so all right we need to you make you're making a very valid point and we need to address okay that. can we make a note we'll make a note of that to make an adjustment all right any other questions in this section right now all right let's move on to section six signage just just one question oh. so when you add up the total signage i know there's um square you know foot numbers um, but if you would just use the diagram in the lower left there, um, can you take every spot there and there's not a total square foot. You can max out every uh, allowable signage location to the maximum amount. Because okay. it's a different type, correct? Okay, yeah, because I know the neighboring town, not far from here, it's a total, you know, based upon the square foot of the 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 you know business the street facing um, footage and if you pull the sign away from the window it's not adhered uh, you can put ever whatever you want in it back there it's not part of the uh, computed square foot you're limited okay so it's a different I mean you could put so it falls into a different using camera. a menu as an example you could put a, a screen a TV whatever um, pull it an inch away from and fill up the window full. <laughs> that, I'm not sure about that. So here is a way to circumvent the total square foot. We, we, don't, I get, we don't have that ability here. It's, it's, if, if, you, if you meet the dimensional criteria and the number criteria, you can have a window and door sign. If you meet the awning criteria for signage, you can have an awning signage. If you meet the wall, the attached I, sign criteria. I get where Paul's try, trying to go, because I've seen some of the companies do it, like U-Haul will typically do that. When they, build, when they build a building, they'll put, the, they'll put all the U-Haul signage, and it'll be, it'll be back. It won't be attached directly to the wall. It'll be back from the, from the window. We were able, in Oshkosh, we were able to classify that as, as signage and limit that. Because it was still, it was still being the intent was still to draw. Um, it fell under the definition of a sign, so we were able, we were able to uh, regulate that. We have a pretty broad definition here too. So. Well, we do need to take another look at the signage, and we, could... we do have the um, allowance for the uh, sandwich board type signage in the historic district, too, which is a another allowance on top of of that so before we move on just you know just from a scale standpoint so if we're talking about a two-story building or even a three-story building which we are showing in just in limited areas in in, in village place you can see so this is even on a three-story facade 
having a sign ban here is much better than having a sign ban up here or up here. It just, it just is, it's better closer to the ground. And can you imagine this, this, this sign, this blade sign, all the way up projecting off the side of the building? Well, yeah, it might help you from 500 yards away to be able to see it better, but again, from a pedestrian interest, it does nothing at the street level. And I don't, you know, it's, and it's not historically accurate. All right, any, Julia? Uh, the first example where there's that, I guess, is that called a blade sign coming out from the side of the building there? Sure, correct, yep. projecting or blade sign. If that had been running vertically rather than horizontally, are you good with it? That, this rule says the, the sign can be a maximum, that could be a maximum of 24 inches. So vertically, depends on the square footage. So it really, it says it can be 24 square. Sure, 24 if the square inches. footage. So if, you, so if we flip this, if we. If, if we, the square footage remained the same, but let's say it said hotel, and now it's going H-O-T-E-L yeah. instead of hotel. Is that kosher or no? I don't think that's, that's not the intent to allow that. It's the, it's the law of the project, the typical, you know, shingle projecting sign coming out. I get you, what you're saying, because you do see it. You, you see it in larger areas. You'll see it on hotels. You'll see mm -hmm. it on cinemas. Mm -hmm. We don't currently, I mean, it falls in a different category, but this is the intent is to allow this type of, this type of signage. Uh, is that, what are your, what are our thoughts on that? Uh, the, the way Julia was talking about it, is that something that you think that we should explore or do we need to make sure, do we need to clarify when we move forward with this, that this, this projecting out that it's going to be further, you know, we could say it's got to be further away from the building than vertically um, perpendicular. perpendicular to Doesn't the, the height cover that? It should. If you turned it, then the height It'd be is... be too high. That's correct, because we say 24 inches. Yeah, they're so so that is that that is the intent. Okay. I mean, that's clearly the intent. So if there's any other intent that we want to try and achieve with that, let you can let and us Matt, know. And that which which number is that in the? Uh, going back on the page before. Yeah, you got to go to the page before. So that will be number nine. Yeah, number nine. On These below signs below the second window. Still yep. perpendicular to the still perpendicular to the building. Okay. Max of twenty four inches in height, forty two inches out. All right, got it. Thank uh, Alex, you. Alex, what's our existing projecting? It's three feet out. Four, four feet. It's just square footage. Four feet. Four foot. Yeah. So we don't we don't have a proportional length proportion requirement. So this would be this would be more restrictive. Script, yeah. So we'd be honing in on something that's more historically accurate. Okay. All right. Anything else on this before we move? This is more conversation than I think we got last time out of this section, but it was involving signage. Uh, all right. So next we'll move on to section six, six, which is the last real section of the document before we get to uh, definitions. So we can pat ourselves on the back that we've got through this thing. Be happy so far. So signage, number six. When you look at this section, it's really set up for, it really taught, it's really, weighted heavily and geared heavily towards public wayfinding signage, street signs, uh, wayfinding, things like that. But there are some, there are some uh, which are all under control um, and which um, we, can have, we can have standards for that would, well, so hold on, I'm gonna give me a minute. All right. So this section, and really, I'm not going to go over line by line in here, but I'm going to hit some. I'm going to hit some of the highlights in the in this particular section. So 6.1 overview. It does really. It's really heavily on the public signs, but there are some sections that really get into the into some of the private re restrictions. Uh, what what we would apply to all the all the development as part of our PDO uh, regulations. So if we go over here to general provisions. Uh, we go to the first bullet, and it says Village Place should contain an eclectic mix of signage that provides a layer of authentic authenticity to the community. Uniformity in signage is not is not desired. So if you have different buildings, we want different type of signage, but we don't want the same sign to be throughout the entire district. You, you want enough architects. You want to allow enough architectural freedom to to 
to put up different signs. And that's why we have other controls in here, but you don't want every sign to look exactly the same throughout the entire district. That's the intent. Because if you go through it, like it says here, uniformity in signage is not desired nor reflective of the existing signage found in Village Center. You want a mix of signage. You want to control the quality, the size, the location, but you want to allow for, for some artistic freedom. So then we go down to bullet number one, two, three. And so it's the long paragraph. And uh, I want to go to the second sentence where it goes, building signs should be located in logical, signable areas which relate to the architecture, e.g. column or architectural spacing of the facade, or column or to the architecture of the facade. Signage areas are often but not always continuous wall surfaces uninterrupted un 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 by doors, windows, or architectural detail. Building signs should enhance and relate to, not obscure, obscure the architectural features of the buildings. So on that previous illustration where I showed that distinct sign band between the first and second floor, that's, the, that's, what, that is gear, that's what that's gearing at. It's talking about that area as being that, that allowable sign area. I did make a note that, and I looked in our definitions, we, didn't actually, we don't actually have a definition of what a, a, what a allowable sign area is. So what I, or co called a signable area, so that would be a, one of the definitions when I asked you, are there other definitions that we need to add as you're looking through the, uh, as you're looking through the code that we need to add to the PDO? Signable area would be another one that, we, that we'd have to, that we should be adding a definition to so we make sure we hone in on those particular areas. I just ask one question. Sure. I might have missed it, that's all. But banners we're talking about are only going to be on... Um, Village poles, street signs, or not streets, but uh, poles. Yeah. So there can't be any vertical banners on sides of buildings. I mean, that's a common thing. So going common. out of going out of business, or grand opening. You see those too. One of the, at the at the beginning or the end. Right. Oh, I don't, Black Friday sale. Do we allow, what, what's the rule of banners? <laughs> it, it's kind of like. They're not normally unattractive. It's under this, the same like temporary section um, with like special events and things like that, but they're, you're not going to see them. Well, you don't want to see them as a permanent sign. I mean, you've seen. It, and you, that's the whole gets at the signs must be professionally etched or painted or things like that. So that's a, a temporary banner sign. Again, it's, it wouldn't be applicable. Okay. All right. Uh, next bullet down, building signs on single-family residential buildings are not permitted. Except well, a question on that. Sure. Um, this doesn't apply since this will all be new construction, but um, XYZ Cottage. That's a good point. But you're right, it wouldn't apply because this would be new. This would all be new construction. Well, I, you know, people like to name their houses. You, you mean like on people's homes? The, and, um, not commercial buildings. And, and it's allowed. Sort so. of a tradition in uh, sure. Piners. To, uh, I mean, there's houses that are you know, recently built last year and they're, you know, so-and-so's cottage, you know, and they give it a little sign up. Oh, so what's the thought? What do you think? I'm Right now, based on what we'd be, we'd be recommending in, in the code itself, it would say you just get, you just get, um, address numbers on that. So if you wanted to name it a cottage of some sort, like you're like you're We don't discussing. want a variance for that. I mean, come no, on. No, you don't want to do that. So the, I guess the question is from a... We, we've been allowing it historically for, I believe it's up to one and a half square feet. Yeah, in, I know that, but it, but it's, it's so more than just I'm, the number. If it's, if it's not a problem now or hadn't been a problem, I would recommend letting that continue to rule and just removing it. Is there anything in the PDO that we would be able to refer back to on that that says that one and a half square feet? This would be more restrictive. Right now, okay. as it sits, if we if we came through with, with this as part of the overlay, it would be more restrictive because it would say just building signage or just just addresses. So we can, we can defer back to what the what the what the rule is if that's that's what. If it's all square feet, and that's pretty much the only permitted signage type that's allowed in. Residential. I mean, family. when we get to the when we get to the regulating plan a little bit later, there's only really one, two areas, right? So, really, only one area that you you potentially see that, 
and that would be that area that would be the old tradition site that would be about the only one that i could see in that district as currently proposed where you would have single <coughs> residential mm -hmm. well, correct who knows? Who knows? okay so you could potentially have you know whatever sign along magnolia road sitting out front saying xyz cottage you know something like that yeah it just uh, i just want to mention it because it sort of no. popped out to my it's head a conflict yeah it doesn't certainly it certainly doesn't offend me when i'm going down when i'm driving down the road seeing uh, seeing one of those signs it's just, it, it, it doesn't bother me but right and, and you're probably not going to be drawn to it no we'll, we'll just defer you. we'll just we can defer back to the we can defer back and that's again that's nitpicking it's not nitpicking it's a good catch check and if everybody else is agree with it, it that's what we need to be doing as part of this process all right difference under content you get it and uh Illumination, the um, third paragraph down, it says, unless incorporated as a secondary or supportive feature. I'm not sure what that is. I don't know what that is, so I, I actually I, I actually just lined it out. You know what that means? I don't know what okay. that means. Okay. Best leave it out then. Uh, I... <clears throat> can, I, can I ask one thing? We're, we haven't quite gotten to that yet, but um, mailboxes. Mm hmm is there going to be any, or would it make sense to think about consistency and or design standards for mailboxes? And the reason I ask that is that um, when mail delivery started here a few years ago, when primarily when the, when the post office shut down, uh, there's a, quite a collection of mailboxes. You know, some are fine. You know, some of them are consistent along the roads. Others could be just about anything you want, you know. Uh, a shoe house or a you know boat or a, you individual know, ones you're whatever, talking your original whatever your personal hobby is um, do we want to even think about having that part of the d standards for the uh, this area i i think i think it makes some sense i mean that's all that all we control that because it would be in it would be in the village right away so this would be the only time to do it probably yeah so we, uh, we could do something like that um, I think you're right because because the the, you, the mass ones that we get in the new subdivisions nowadays, right? That that is you know the square aluminum ones that you know we see it like the new subdivisions. Well, in new subdivisions, the post office requires kiosks. They don't even want to do home delivery, so that yeah. sort of settles that. So we're setting that aside. You're just talking about the in, again the individual mail mailing receptacle that's generally out in the right away. Should we have? Oh, that yeah yeah okay okay. With the idea being we just would not want like a novelty style mailbox you mean like a sailboat yeah, like, so or, like a fish's yeah. mouth that opens and wags its tail or something you know i mean i'm the guessing that's the idea yeah. I, <laughs> sorry I, it's cool <laughs> <laughs> i think that one ought to be allowed <laughs> i was gonna say if, if, if it's out there you know, but, but that's the idea right okay well if it gets really you know maybe that's more of something we react to i don't know I mean, it's worth posing a question, I guess. But I'm not trying to make more work. I just no, it, it ought to be a you know on a you know on a little side mention. We should we discuss it? You know. No, that's another thing that you know if something if you if you really meant it's that's sitting right there in the square in the middle of the public realm. You see it, and if you do something that's really awful, it can you know it can look bad and and. And not, how how many do you think we'll run into if we're going to have a lot of this will be non-residential are they going to have would yeah, the delivery a, come inside or yeah good point. understand well we'll put that down as a parking lot item to get back to all right so matt you had a question did you have a question ahead of that ahead of jack just always commenting okay you're waiting no i don't have anything <laughs> okay no. all right my, well my question was is there a difference between nitpicking and making a good point but uh, it depends on how I feel about it at the time. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> All right. Um, the next one, uh, bullet, bullet number one, two, three, four, right under what Jack had just get, gone into. Backlit, halo lit illumination, or reverse channel letters with halo illumination are encouraged for, for commercial signage. It says, such signs shall convey a subtle and attractive appearance and are very legible under moderate ambient lighting conditions. Next one down from that, uh, project, projecting light fixtures, e.g. gooseneck lights, used for externally illuminated signs shall be simple and unobtrusive in appearance. 
So I guess we, you know, what we really need to have is probably, if we're going to do say we're going to have something like that, rather than say simple and unobtrusive, is to have a couple, maybe is to have a couple types of, if there's a spec out there. I'm not sure if there's a spec out there for goosenecks, but maybe that's something we need to look into, just for when we, because then what it sets us up for potentially is an arbitrary decision on that. What? I feel like you're just trying to see how many times you can say gooseneck in a meeting. All right. So moving on. Two more down. I, I just have one comment. All right. Because, you know, I always do. Um, Good. So the sign police regulating all this, they know they all have the same definition of obscure <clears throat> or um, there's a lot of judgment descriptions in here. So it's, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, it has to have an attractive appearance. Well, my attractive might not be your attractive. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, you know, just get into these situations where it's not easy if we don't decide, de define what it is and we're not defining it. I'm probably not making sense, but no, you, it, it no. just there's a lot of judgment call. You're preaching. Yeah. You you are you are making you're making a lot of design sense. And what, what this is this really this document itself is really the the document that we use to move forward when when we actually put when we actually seat this into the ordinance. Not everything's going to make it into the. That we're not just adopting this and we're going to enforce this. We have to put this in in the PDO and actually have some some real clear language in there. I think the intent is a box sign, a wall sign, something like a box or a cabinet sign. I think people generally we're trying to discourage that because we don't think it's we don't think it's a pleasing type of sign in a in a historic environment. So I think it you know some of those things it might be getting at maybe a, a pin letter sign that doesn't have any dimension to it. So a pin letter would be like an individual channel letter. The, the ones that have dimensions are, you know, the ones that aren't just completely flat, but, you know, it's two to three inches thick, so it has some, it has some dimension against, against the wall. So I think at some point, as much as we try and remove any type of interpretation as possible, there are some times where we just have to make an interpretation. But we, try, we, do, try and less, we do try and lessen that. As long as everybody's consistent, but, you know, 20 years down the road, you know, you're not going to have the same people doing it. Here's another thing, though. So, so say we're coming through and we're doing a, we're doing a conditional zoning in this district, and we go, all right, let's start to look at the code, or let's start to look at the form-based code. Let's let's look at the village place plan, and as we're doing, as we're reviewing it, we're almost treating it like we would be coming through under a quasi quasi judicial process. We're looking at, is the plan that you're proposing, is it, is it, is it. Congru is it congruous with these plans? So I think that's that's also the way to look at it because the vast majority of things I think that we see are going to come through are not a vast majority. Some things that come through might need a conditional zoning. That's when we pull out these documents. That's where these documents become very important. That's why whatever gets adopted in these documents or approved, that's why you know we're going through this process. So if we don't, if we see something that just doesn't fit or doesn't make sense, it's got it comes out. You know things like that, but as we're reviewing it, and so, and somebody says, "Well, that's not a good-looking sign," and then we have a discussion on that as part of that process, and who knows where we end up with that. But at that point, we're going to have, hopefully, we're going to have an actual example to look at what they're proposing, and if it's crazy, then you know, we go, "No, we don't like that." Well, Louise, she's hit on a key issue, <laughs> having gone through this in space with the uh, HPC rewrite and the. Uh, and being on the commission, and there's a lot of shoulds in here. In other words, it should look this way, it should be this, mm -hmm. it should that. Um, and shoulds are okay, but you can't deny a request for a building uh, permit or a, you know, a plan based upon a should. It has to be more definitive. And so um, those shoulds are nice, and I understand uh, the Conditional zoning or conditional use, certainly you can go back and use judgment yes. and, and judge your judgment against some type of criteria in here. But right. uh, on a day to day basis, I don't see how staff can utilize the shoulds. Can't. We can't. So, wherever possible, you know, we're going to remove the shoulds to a shall. 
Oh, so that was. But you, will be. Hmm? Yes. When, the trouble with the shells and the musts and all the rest of that, you know, it becomes uh, difficult on the other side. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but if we don't, we got to have we we have to have something from a, from a starting point to have some type of regulation. So, you know, I I can't point out a should anywhere right now, but we do say things like. Um, I think a good example is the lighting. You know, you have a lot of references to how the sun should be lit. Now, mm -hmm. if you look at the location, the size, the total square foot, I think that's pretty well covered. But lighting, I mean, you could, I mean, you can turn up the lighting as high as you want. You know, there's no restriction. So, you know, should there be something that governs outside, you know, in theme with what we're already seeing, um, you know, so you're, you've just, you know, here's a, here's a row of, buildings, everyone's, you know, at, you know, 10 looms, and here's a guy on 100 looms. You know, where's all your attention going to go to? Um, you know, that, there's cert that's certainly vague, um, but there's a lot of things here that, that um, you know, if someone wants to take advantage of it, they're going to take advantage of it. Um, and I think when, you know, applying Lewis's example, you know, what's appropriate to one may not be to others. If there's a way to quantify it or measure it, mm -hmm. you know, then you just apply the standard to it. I agree. I mean, but you're. I just wouldn't have too many shoulds. I mean, it seems to me that the consultants have given us something with a lot of it should look great, it should be this, and should be wonderful. But um, wherever possible, I think we should remove the shoulds and try to use some uh, objective uh, measurement technique. Um, I, it's impossible to do that 100 percent, but um, I think we ought to be careful not to have too many. It should be pretty much should change I, the shoulds to shall. I, I well, if if there's a if there's a standard that I can apply with that shall, if there's a standard that I can write, I can guarantee you that when we move forward with an actual ordinance update, we're not going to have shoulds in there. Just not there's not going to be shoulds. But can we lessen some of the shoulds or or remove some of the shoulds in here? Uh, if we'll take a after we get out of this meeting, we'll, we'll do a document. We'll do a document search, look for all the shoulds, and see. Well, what can? What is there a harm of keeping it there, or can we take it out, or do we need to? Write, or do we need to write a standard? Have to see the whole package yeah. really to see whether. It, uh, and we're and we're getting towards. We're almost there. Got it. Okay. And I think some of it's organizational with the document too. Some of the stuff is more like purpose and intent type language where it kind of sets the stage and then you follow up with the Good actual point. prescriptive. Yeah, language. it's similar to the HPC document. Some of it's tutorial in the sense that it teaches yeah. you what good practices are uh, and then other parts of it is more uh, requirements. And it kind of hey, just sets there? the stage. Every every section of zoning codes have a purpose intent. Like the intent of the signing section is to not have signage clutter but to da 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 and you know, this is your vision and what you want to see. Now here is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And it's based on that intent. That's a good point. Sorry, Some Jeremy. of those shoulds could be in the purpose. It could be in the introduction and purpose <laughs> section. But you're right. No, I, I think Alex and I and all the staff agree. We don't like shoulds. <laughs> we don't. Hey, hey, Darren. Earlier this I conversation, don't like, yeah, the other you were subjective language either. Yeah. You were able to kind of verbalize some signs that would not fit mm -hmm. an attractive level. Mm -hmm. Is there a way in this document that we could put those into words? Yep. Like, should not. So, so shines, signs yep. should not look like this or should not have this qual these qualities to it yep. and counteract some of these shoulds, possibly. It, would that give some direction? Mm -hmm. That is. And if you look at, if you look at uh, under content and illumination, go down to the third bullet, and we say, and this is a pretty strong design criteria, internally illuminated acrylic or flexible vinyl face si box, which is really box wall cabinet, which I made a note that that needs to be adjusted, are not permitted. There you go. That's a that's an not permit. You can't have the box the box wall type signs. So that that that's a that's a strong that's a pretty strong statement of what you can't have. Any more of them that we can add or anything as well? Um, it would take away some of that objectivity that that we could face in the future. And then I don't know if there's an opportunity at all to provide some illustrations of what could not happen. Gotcha. Happen. Just an idea. Let's when we go into the next column, I think that's going to cover some of it because there there might be some ways to strengthen it up. But let's just get through this column and then we'll move on to the next one. If you go down, here's another. Darren, I have a comment, separate comment before okay. we move on. Okay, so 
in the, the bullet we just went through, number four, mm -hmm. it says the backlit halo, halo lit reverse are encouraged for commercial commercial signage. But if you go back to section five mm -hmm. um, that we went through, number 11 says signs shall be externally lit with decorative visible light sources. So to me, that sounds like the preference is not backlit, but it's for what these images show, which is an external light source. So then to come here and say the preference is backlit, what is preferred? Is it the decorative external light source shining on the light, or is it that, that, that section does conflict, you're right. I think uh, location the sign is going to determine that. You know, if it's a banner sign, maybe you could have a backlit. If it's a, uh, a um, you know, one off a, uh, like a shingle or whatever, then how can you backlit that? Right, you but know, a, a, a like building a, sign could be both, and I think if they're... Building sign could be both, you're right. So we've got to reconcile those two. Yeah. That's a good point. Is there any... Uh, do we need to pull up some examples of what pin lighting and backlighting is for? Do you all... I mean, we could pull up that example to show you what a pin lighted sign looks like. Um, I, I had pulled up a couple here to look at it just to make sure I was clear. <laughs> I saw one. Is there, is there a preference, I mean, amongst us here that, to propose, whether it be, or just along either or? Any, any strong feelings either way, whether it, be, whether it be the gooseneck lighting or the, or the backlit? <laughs> Let me get that one. Is there a preference? I'm not going to say it again. I think depending upon the sign is, to, you know, each one's going to, take its own construct and, you know, there's ways to make either one, you know, attractive and good looking. So rather than just saying, you know, you can, you can either, you can either externally light it or backlit it, you can do either or. I mean, we could say that, you're right, the encouraged is just, a, that's getting back to the shoulds. Uh, encouraged is a should. In all your graphics on the other one show externally lit. Mm -hmm. So... At least at this point, if we're going on the visual part of it, which is hard to show backlit on visual, but when you, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're showing the if you're showing the light, then we know it's externally lit. Historic district, Alex, is there any is there any anything in the historic district on um, externally lit or back, backlit signs? We yeah, we've been we don't allow in, internal illumination on a lot of our signage. But that's internal, that would be like a... We don't talk back, we don't differentiate between backlit or it's just internally or, ex or externally illuminated. Okay, so I, I, I would imagine just because of the lighting, the way it is today, it's gonna make it easier to back, you know, light something, but you know, 50, 60 years ago, you're not gonna have the ability to do that, I mean, to make it look decent. Yeah. I need more research to see because you don't want to put it in there and create without a a standard that all of a sudden it's just that's that's true. This. It gets back to uh, you might have said it or Jack said it about how bright it'd be. So, so if you backlight that thing and and you're just you know and it's just zooming off into the right away just because you're trying to outcompete your neighbors on either side of you, you're right. I actually thought the village standard was that it had to be externally lit um, in before outside of form based code. So to see backlit separate from internally lit, lit was is kind of a surprising distinction to me. Okay. Well that's something we need to do a little bit more research on. Okay. I mean at the very least, you know, even if we can't figure something out right away, we we always have the, the externally lit to to always mm -hmm. fall back to. And then we can continue to work on a, on a, on a standard, on an a, a backlit if we need that. All right. So same column down to the, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here's another, here it becomes, a should's going to become a shall. Uh, or, um, should not's going to become a shall. It's same thing, shall. Uh, all electrical connections, including junction boxes, transformers, conduit, raceways, and tubing required for any side items should not shall not be exposed they they shall be concealed and out of public view I mean that's the intent you know what wires running down the side of the building with that you want to figure that out some other way when you're building a building you can figure that one out all right next column sign design and materials 
and here there are some shoulds in here, but these shoulds guide us to, to guide us to some of the more concrete uh, code examples. So we talk about in uh, uh, bolt number two, dimensional signs, letter forms, and decorative brackets are encouraged. That that needs to be think, that needs to become a I was shell. Just say I think quality materials is in the mind at the site of the observer. You're right. I don't know what quality means. Well, I mean, we know it. We know what bad quality is. It's just the, how do you define how do you define it? Because when you see a bad sign, you know you've seen the bad sign. So how do you how do you want to not get them? And again, I think our our existing PDO provides a pretty good backstop that we can build off of. But when we talk about we want signs that have some dimension to them, you don't want just a flat. And you've seen this, I think, on Market Street itself, just a flat sign that's just maybe painted on in the sign band. It has no dimension. It has nothing to it. It just doesn't. The dimensional signs, I think, look a little. I mean, again, this is a personal, this is a personal, personal, uh, personal opinion. But any signs that have a little bit of dimension just stand out, feel a little bit better from a pedestrian standpoint, and look a little bit better, I think, architecturally. I was gonna say, yeah, I think I think you're 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 right there. The hard part is how to define it to where it doesn't become, you know, a conflict uh -huh. with everything else that's around it. So that's that's exactly right. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, okay. and I'm I'm sure somebody's written a code. I'm sure, we I'm sure we can find. I'm sure, we can we can actually lay our hands on something like that. Um, next sign would be it, it. Next one bullet would be a third bullet down where sign letters are pin mounted. They should have dimensional returns to give the appearance of a solid dimensional material. Again, that's that's if you had a pin-mounted sign, it was, it was thin out, thin like this. So you'd want to add something that has dimension to all all the letters. So that's all that is. So you're not just seeing this flat sign. I don't have anything else on this page. Any other questions on this page? If you look at signage for village places, anticipated to employ a variety of materials and illumination techniques, including painted aluminum metals. I made a note on that one. Natural, natural finished materials, metals, including bronze, aluminum, steel, and stainless steel. Uh, etched and polished materials, cast metals, plaques, natural opaque hard surface materials, such as brick or stone, glass, including frosted colored pattern and clear, exterior grade vinyl materials. I'm making a note. That acrylic poly, poly resin materials, high density urethane and LED illumination. I think this gets into when we really need to come back when we do the code itself. We we need to have some stronger architectural standards versus some of the shoulds that are in here, and I, we can work on that. Again, we're not we're not inventing the wheel on this. All right, next page. And this just goes into the general types of signage. And I'm not going in, I'm not going in detail on, in, on any of these unless somebody wants to. So we start uh, this section, which is section 6.2, uh, sign types and standards. Uh, the first one we're talking about, you can see that, um, oh, here's just, just a note. There's a reference right here. We start talking about for building mounted signage on commercial mixed use buildings. See the storefront signage section on page 59 for requirements. So you can see that this section is really geared more towards the public wayfinding signage. So if you look over to the the far right column, it talks about having a standard for permanent uh, permanent identification signs. That would be some. That would be like a development sign. We don't have any subdivisions here, but it would be a sub, could be a potential subdivision sign. Like, think about you know the the tradition site could have potentially had some type well, of sign. Well, here, here here's a question I have. I mean, the consultants have kind of given us a lot of boilerplate stuff. To be honest with you, um, I can't imagine that we're going to have identification signs you know, that we're going to put outside of a. Uh, village place to say you're now entering village place. I mean, are we going to identify this separately? I mean, what's the point of even having this section? Uh, my other uh, comment is um, I think a lot of this is just explaining what different signs are uh, you know, for the casual reader. I think in every case we ought to have a picture that is local. I mean, I don't really want to see a 
picture from, uh, you know, Texas or Bell Grove or wherever the heck these other places are. And we're going to have pictures in here of examples of signs. Hopefully we have good examples to take pictures of locally and put in the document. I don't think we should use these pictures from other locations around the country. And That's an stuff. if, if we have appropriate signs, correct? Well, I'll agree. I'll agree with that. And, and although I, I think the intent of specifically here, the 6.2 is, is, is the definitions of the difference in signs. I, I would just hate for us to get into a situation where because the picture looked like a sign and we didn't want to approve it or we felt like it was, you know, contradicting to something, they said, well, there's the picture of it right there. I want to make a sign that's close to that. I don't want to get in, you know, I'd hate for us to get into that type of, you know, sticky situation with somebody. And I think if we want a document that is somewhat aligning with our community, I think local pictures are important. And that also presumes that we have a good local example. Uh, we could point. we could have bad local examples and go not this. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Other than we ought to search out good examples. <laughs> no, no actions on on any applications will be made on an image, especially any administrative decision. The text always rules, so I don't don't have too much concern over that. But I'm yeah, just just thinking through my head. There's a couple of easy examples that we have locally we could use. And a lot of these points, at some point, we're going to be at, we, we, we're either, we may be at an administ a legislative decision making. Yeah, and you could. So then you could use this as a guide for that particular development if it's coming in under some legislative process. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to, now, uh, I'm correct out. I think the chances that some would would make <laughs> this a singular situation for the village are very low, but if there was another um, issue, it certainly could be coupled along with it just to, you know, contradict the document, so. Well, every yeah, we single one of these sign types I can uh, imagine, in fact, I know of, uh, we have good examples in the village. We have street signs, we have waste-finding signs, we have banner signs, we have, uh, you know, um, historic preservation district signs, we have, uh, there's a good example in the village, I think, for every one of these categories that we could probably use. And I uh, recommend we use them. Well, we've got to find them. So, so if you have an idea where some of these are, let me. I want to search some. Let, 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 I don't want to send people out just patrolling, looking for these, looking for these sites. So give me an example. And, and that's, easy, that's easy to do. We're also working on that downtown amenities plan. So I've been talking with Jeff Batten a little bit about how these, how these two things could. To, that's could, Tuesday's could, discussion. Could, yeah. Correct. All right, next page. And we don't have to go into depth on it, but this is just showing in Jack. Right, we can find some of these. I don't. I think the the image is, you know, if you're going to a vehicle direction sign, you know, you're showing that top one would be, you know, what they're talking about for for directing somebody to parking, directing somebody to, I don't know, name an example, the the, the arboretum, you know, things like that. Um, I think what, what it's trying to get at is they're trying to establish some type of uniformity in, in the system itself so they, so you, you have some type of... Don't we have, though, already, though? I mean, we have a, a considerable number of directional signs in the village. But, we're already, but that's part of what we're talking about tomorrow is, is taking a look at them. Okay. And, I, you know, if you look at some of the, look at some of the, the resorts, way, way finding signage, it needs, it's dated. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of that needs to be updated, so it could fall under, you know, something like this. But the, the beauty of all this is that it's all going to be in a public realm. So everything everything is public realm. So we as the, you know, the council that can make that decision. It's not, you know. Right. It, 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 the PDO, as a matter of fact, doesn't even touch regulations for signage and, and rights of ways. It doesn't, no. no. Right. Mm -hmm. It does not. So this this becomes more. This is really there's there's sections of the form based code which are really hard hard PDO related. The site and design standards, the regulating plan, uh, maybe some of the street stuff uh, with respect to the ESSM. When we get to some of these, this is this is just you know talking about the types of signs that are out there and it's and interesting tutorial exactly. But you know what, you do raise a good point. Let's find some of the local examples so we so we can right. so so we can. If possible. So we can, if possible, and if there's something where we're missing, 
you know, then then we pick that up. Like, I mean, just a question to everybody. I I'm not comfortable with the applied vinyl lettering. I mean, it's just it's something that ends up peeling. It also um, washes out. You know, stuff like that. I, if you guys are fine with it, I I just find it. Especially lettering, like in, where is that? Which one are you talking, the banner signs? The sign should not contain internal illumination. No, text. Text or sign shall be fabricated. Applied vinyl. Where are you looking? You really have to kind of police. Them. That's on this pedestrian directional signs. Okay. It, it, it actually should apply to any place. They just easily, they just easily stand at the bottom. Easily peel off unless they're not maintained well. And sometimes, yeah. So you're looking at. You found it to be a problem, but. You're, you're, you're looking at this sign right here, right? This is the one you're kind of looking at. Versus the one on top, which has got the, the when we talk about having some dimension to it, this, these are the signs that have some dimension to it. And, but uh, under it. You have what looks to be something like an applied, like an applied vinyl sign. Because it can be individual letters. I mean, not it doesn't necessarily have to be one long strip like you're showing in there. They could. Well, there are those sandblasted signs that are made to look like wood, and then they have the applied vinyl over the top of the raised lettering to provide color. That's fine. Yeah. But put a. I don't know whether this applies to the awnings and whatever, but that has a tendency to fade and come up. Because well, that's what normally, when you put it on the glass, isn't that what it is on glass? Which works fine on glass, but you're ta not talking about that. Yeah. Because yeah. like on the windows, I mean, that's what those, those letters that you adhere yeah. and then pull yeah, off. Not necessarily talking about that. Yeah, okay. Was there a recommendation that regard what we should be doing? A village place is meant to be sort of an extension of our current uh, center downtown, if you want to call it that. Um, shouldn't we have consistent signage yes. throughout? Okay. Yes, we should. I think it's going to extend the similar or the exact sign, same signage into village place as we are using in the rest of the. Uh, downtown uh, Pinehurst area. Exactly. And really what we should be looking at, and I'll have to take another look at it, is the amenities plan and see how, how these two pair up with pair up with the amenities plan that's that's coming through right now. All right. And we don't want it to look like, you know, you're in downtown Pinehurst and all of a sudden you're in a different city. Here. Well, <laughs> all of a, you know, it's like, well, what it's happened? Not, I went two blocks. You well, know? you're over here in, you know, Bohemian Town or you're over here in Chinatown or you're right. over here, you know, you want some, <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just being, you want some, I, I, I get you want some consistency. So, and I think that's the intent is there should be consistency between village the center. Flow. And, yeah, yeah, flow, right? Some flow, yeah. And the wayfinding along the way should have that same flow. Okay. Uh, is there anything else in this particular, uh, the only real note that I have on street name signs to, to have the PDO references on page 77, which would be street name signs. And I, uh, if you look at, there, there are two standards that are in here. So if you go all the way down to one, two, three, four, the fifth bullet, we talk about, this is where we actually talk about recommended height for signage. So you go at or near Rattlesnake at NC211 intersection. Then we talk about six inches for uppercase and then lowercase minimum height, 4.5. And the reason, it, and then you go down to all of the commercial signs of four and a three. And the reason for the difference is at Rattlesnake, and 211, you got a, you got a little bit higher speed moving through through that area. So I think that's a recommendation over on that side. Uh, it's not it's not a major thing. In, it's not a major other than sitting up at Rattlesnake. That's that's the only difference. But you get down to the next one right here. Any projecting overhead sign located within the streetscape shall be mounted no less than eight foot above the ground level, and that's pretty standard. And then or 18 18 foot above any roadway, driveway, or alley. So and should be should be street sidewalk right. So that gets at a dimensional criteria for a blade sign that we didn't have in that previous section that has to follow follow through over there. Reading that last 
paragraph again here? Any, right here. I, overhead sign. Any projecting overhead sign. Oh, that's a different type of sign. Never mind, I'm, that's not even a blade sign. Any projecting overhead sign located within the streetscape shall be mounted no less than eight foot above the ground level and 18 foot or 18 foot above the roadway drive or alley. That's a different type. Never, for some reason when I read that, I was reading the blade, I was reading the blade requirements going, that, that's a blade requirement. It's a requirement that we actually don't have in there, but I, I'm pushing it over to that section. But this is just how, you have to have a minimum height of a street sign of 18 feet and you don't want it more than 18, eight, minimum, minimum of eight, no more than 18 feet. Eight to 18. <laughs> Are we talking about signs that would go over the street itself? That could be one of them, or it could be any sign that's projecting out, yeah. Beyond yeah, the curve. into the right way, correct, correct. Uh, this one's talking, the 18 feet is, you know, kind of an overhead roadway sign, you know, next exit two miles or something like that. Not going to have much of that. Right? No, you're not going to have much of that. But you also have seen some signs where if you're in some of these special places, and I'll just say special neighborhoods where you'll right. have a, a sign over the road, welcome to this neighborhood or welcome uh, to yeah, that, okay. something like that. So you, you want to, and the reason for the 18 foot is you don't want to have tractors. Tra <laughs> you don't have tractors. Like to, our underpants. Like, yeah. like, like the trestle, yes. All right, so that finishes up that section. Again, there's not a heck of a lot in this because it's, most, it's mostly public related. Next session is de definitions, and we really don't, I don't need to go into any definitions unless you had any questions or really what I was looking for, were there any other definitions that we think that as part of going through part of this process, do I need to add any? I thought the allowable, the signable area is one I want to add. Townhouse, I think we need to, we might need to update our townhouse regs or our townhouse definition. Um, we did, you see, I did add a thing for active frontage because a lot of people didn't understand what active frontage is when, when, you, when you're starting to look at the regulating plan. So I thought, you know, we need to have a definition of what active frontage is because active frontage with respect to this plan is something that, that has an extra level of, of, of restrictions with it, meaning retail, you know, some type of retail or restaurant operation, anything like that. Alex? That mixed use building definition. So Not, that seems to have halls. All right, let's read mixed use. They're saying mixed use building. That, that's a that's a needed definition now. It's a what? Needed definition. A structure containing two or more uses whose ground floor use is typically but not limited to retail office, retail restaurant office or building lobby or amenity space with residential and office. Res, yeah, here you go. Residential or office space on upper floors. So do we need, do you think we need to improve that? I, I, I just think it's a definition we've been needing, especially considering the building types for the regulating plan in Village Place. I think it might need to be a little stronger. Okay. Instead of typically just flag it. Because I think the idea is that we would, we would seat most of these in our PDO section 10.2 definitions, don't you think? We need to really go through these. Any other thoughts from? Uh, do we need the the definition of the green roof? Are we really gonna? Are we gonna <laughs> have? Uh, about Vista. I thought we discussed that at some point in time. Whether we have flat roofs that people would be have gardens on and so forth. I can't remember that we came out okay on that or not. To tell you the truth. I don't think we were promoting. I I'm didn't lucky. think we were promoting green roofs on that. Yeah, I know we were down on the uh, rooftop seating. Rooftop patios. Yeah, we were. Well, I mean, you can have a definition, and, and it's. Any other question marks in there that y'all are seeing? Build two line. We know to build two line, and some of some of the other things are, some of the other things are architectural uh, phrases <clears throat> that we want to get in there, just so people know when they're reading. I it. think the definition of active frontage is key here, um, and so that's why I just want to. Drill a little bit on that one, um, uh, because active frontage requires, I mean, it definitely changes a lot of building types. Um, so building amenities, in other words, active frontage is where a retail or restaurant uh, space lobbies or building amenities must be located. To, What's uh, building amenities? Amenities. I'm a little not sure exactly 
what we were getting at when we said building amenities. Let me look into that. Let me research that. I, I, I don't. Let me look at some definitions of that. I, I agree. I can envision a, I'm a not concept sure. of what a building amenity is. That a building amenity is it has a restaurant. I mean, uh, or it has a, a retail store or whatever. I'm, I'm just a little confused. Yeah, that's a that's good catch. We don't want something in there as extraneous that's going to confuse yeah. us. Okay. But you look at, you know, originally when this process started out with active frontage, you know, when we were talking about this, the, the original proposal was 100% of the linear frontage of the building was going to be an active, was going to be an active type of use. I think as we talked about this during the, during the development process of the regulating plan, we, we ratcheted that down a little bit. On a percentage uh, basis, I recall, somewhere yeah. in that document, somewhere yeah. in this big document. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were ratcheted that down to 60%. So if you have a, if you have a building, if you're building a, multi a multi use building what what this is saying is at the active level 60% of that frontage of that building and we might have to we might have to play with square footage but 60% of that elevation has to be in some type of a, some type of active type of use you got a that, 100 foot building frontage uh, and 60% of it has to be retail and or restaurant that's correct okay and i and the reason it, it did it did start at 100% so we did we did move down uh, down to around fifty. So this this is a, a real. In fact, let's why don't why don't we? Here, here's a question on that. Um, restaurants sometimes have an entrance, but the real the restaurant is deeper in the building. It doesn't necessarily abutting or to have glass frontage to the street. Um, if you walk in a restaurant. And most of the restaurant is in the back, but the, the, the width of the restaurant use of the facility is 60% of the building. But the front is used for different purposes. I, I did not, I'm not explaining this very well. Uh, so in other words, what is retail I can semi understand, uh, although sometimes retail stores you go in and they don't necessarily have the whole street frontage. Part of it is in the back. Mm -hmm. What is the rest of the frontage? So we're saying what is what is active frontage? Active frontage is uh, uh, glazing or what? What is it? What mean? should be stored? It should actually be occupiable space. So basically, okay, all the way up to that wall, that wall that abuts the uh, street, the front, the wall that abuts the street has to be. A in use as a restaurant and or retail. retail. That, that would that would be my interpretation, and maybe we just need to, maybe we just need to again work on Probably that. Probably making active. something more difficult than it needs to be. Well, I mean, if you, I think you make a lot of sense in a, in a larger context. So if it's in a large, I think you can see that more often in, in a very big building potentially. I think the scale of just the scale of our buildings. I don't think they're going to be. We're talking one to mostly two-story buildings yeah, probably probably that, area, not, that aren't going to be that deep. But I think it's something that somebody might try and get around. So they might say, okay, I'm going to do 60% of the frontage, but it's only going to be a foot back, and then I'm going to put something else in there. If you don't have, you know, if you don't have a, a companion amount of square footage in there, if you just say linear, there's somebody that can get around that. So we, we, That front wall that, that determines the use of the, on the other <clears throat> side of that front wall, is what determines active frontage. Is that sound and, like and a, that's the that's the intent? So if isn't it, like a Theo's, which is in the back court, which is unusual. Uh, well, it, yeah, it, what's well, it's unusual? Yes. Courtyard restaurants are not terribly unusual, but uh, you know Theo's back there, but the whole front is really at least a part real of it is, is real estate offices and professional offices or whatever you want to call it. That's not what you'd want, though, right? That's not what the active frontage is trying to is trying to promote. You're not trying to promote those offices on the front. You want to promote that active use. Okay. Now, you you have you have hit on something, a courtyard-style development. And I guess we'd have to think through what that would look like. But our, The regulating plan wouldn't allow for that type of use on the ground floor anyway. Right? Which type? Anything other than retail. Well, no, we, 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 with, we ratcheted that. It, it sta we started at 100%. Right. 
and then we talk through it, and maybe when we get back to the regulating plan, maybe we'll talk through it some more. But we ratcheted that back to 60%. So Jackson just said, if it was a 100-foot building, 60% of that, 60 of that would have to be, of the, right now the way it sits, 60% of that linear frontage of that building, which needs, to be, which needs to be combined with square footage, would have to be an active use. Then the other thing could be, it could potentially be an office use. And maybe that's but not if, the But right if the ratio. regulating plan, all our regulating plan within active frontage now mm -hmm. is either mixed use, retail, live work, or hotel. Those are the only four uses. But a mixed use building could frontage. be but a mixed use building could but be if something we define other. It is a mixed use that the office has to be upstairs, not on the ground floor. Right. And that takes care of it. That's true, except for the tradition site. Because it's got the where well, the red is supposed to be on the opposite side. It's oh. not for the. Oh, okay. well, I can't remember how that. Was. We let this go for now. I just no, no. Let's it. let's not let let's not let this go. This is this is really important. Well, I, I know we'll revisit if it's an issue. So. Well, what and and and, and pull it pull out your regulating pad. Yeah, well, you were on the definitions, and I just asked you about the. No, it's right, because the definition has to and, pair up with what's on the regulating plan. Shannon, pull up that. Please pull up the regulating plan. And that's what I was getting at about that mixed use that. building definition. I don't think I can get to stronger. It, can I? Oh, I can. Never mind. Oh, I got it. See, I'm not as helpless as I thought. Zoom it in. <sighs> so this has all our known updates. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. I don't know what this is. Look up the top. Maybe. I can't drive this. The hand, right? If you hit the hand with it. <sighs> All right, I, Janet, can you help me out here? I don't know. Right. There you go. Oh, I got it. Now that's good enough. Now, right. now hit the hand so you're not selecting. Does it not let you do that? No, it doesn't, it doesn't work when you download it through Novus. See? Oh, never mind. There we go. Looks good. Ah, you got the hand. You're good. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's get back to the, the, the active frontage requirement. So if you can see with, with this regulating plan, I did, we peeled back yep. all the active frontage that was in this area because we, we, we were saying we want to focus it into this area. So we pulled it back so to, to create this as that. Not core. to say it couldn't happen. I mean, so yep. still, okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. It can still happen here. So it's really, we pulled it back here. And what we're saying is, so based on, the, based on the definition, the new definition that we have, and we have to reconcile that with a mixed use definition, Alex, um, this we would say that 60% of the frontage of this block, well, that's, that's the brewery, 60% of the frontage of this block would have to be active use, a retail or a restaurant type use or whatever, whatever else that is. That means 40% could be something else on the first floor. Is that what we want? Or do we, and, and we may have had that discussion because we were shown so much active use that, because we were shown all that active use all the way up McIntyre here to Kelly, and then we were shown that active use almost all the way up the block here uh, on Rattlesnake, so, so and, and down Mac. I was racking my brain to try to figure out, okay, what is an active use if it's not office use? And one of the things that came to mind that we discussed before was, um, oh, I forget what we called them, like uh, dog groomers or salons or... Um, I had salons as a note. Right, personal services, thank you. Um, because I, I think about when you go into the village now, between Tinya, or not, no longer Tinya, Nico, and the, a little dress shop, there's a nail salon, which, you know, fits nicely in that neighborhood if you're thinking about, oh, I'm going to go downtown and do something with my friends today. Um, so is that an active use or does it need to leave this district? I think that's a good point. I think I, I made a note too because I think I made a note on my, when I was looking through my notes, I had specifically said salon and... I think maybe we need to look or at is, what the definition of... Or is that of, the 60, or is that the other 40%? You know? I, I mean, I, can, I could see a point for having that as, as being allowed. It doesn't fit the criteria? I don't think it does because it's, 
Is that a retail use? It's personal service, it's more of a retail, it's not a retail use really. It's not a restaurant for sure, probably. Um, but maybe we do, maybe we need to be expansive, a little bit more ex expansive with that. I could see why it'd be nice to have uses like a personal service, like a like a salon Barber. or nail, Barber. What's, yeah, pardon me? Barber. Or a barber, something like that. Because I think that, Jack even said tailor. I know they're not around sure. as much. But, Be, because know. that's a use. Or well, dry cleaner or something. A tailor doesn't know. get that kind of that much action really during during the day where people are coming in, sitting in the chairs, they're getting their haircuts. You know, see, look at a typical salon and how many people are in there. What do you do when you're done with the salon? A lot of times you're going to go you're going to go over here to get something to eat, or you're going to go shopping elsewhere. And the the other nice thing, if you have more restaurants that are open later at night. You're going to have less. You'll have less um, competition for parking, either at the street level in front or in the back. So maybe having, allowing, you know, looking more to what a personal service is, allowing more of those in the block would, would actually create almost like a shared parking situation. I hear night. yourself talking. I hear you talking yourself into it. <laughs> well, no, you've talked me into it. I, I think it, I mean I think it does I I think it does make some sense. You, you think about the way downtown Southern Pines operates now. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there there are salons on every block. And they do bring a lot of people. It's not like in barbershops and salons do house a, have a lot of seats in them. So maybe it is maybe if we do make that someone Let me let's we, we can go and produce. Are there any other uses that we might want on an active? Want to say anything story, else that that's out there? I mean, we're thinking of the typical, um, the typical uh, personal, you know, the salons. Are there anything else that might be out there? Um, repair shops. Once again, thinking about downtown Southern Pines, that little watch repair shop around the corner from the knitting store. That place. I'm always waiting in line to get in there. You know, a, a shoe repair shop. Um, I don't know. Uh, the, the um, you know, in downtown Southern Pines, the tack shop, which is a retail store, has a leather goods repair in there, which is constantly busy. So I would say a tack shop, because you, you have a strong retail component to a tack shop, right? Even a shoe, even a shoe place, but that would be retail. So both those, both those are retail. So they, so they would be allowed. Well, they, and the they, watch place as well as re, as well. Retail. Yeah, they have a they have a re retail component. They're a mixture of service and retail. You can go in there to buy a watch, or you can go in there to have your watch band repaired or your battery replaced, or your like a jewelry store where they yeah, repair sure. jewelry, jewelry sure. but they also sell. Sure, and the same is true with the tack shop. They sell tack, but they also do leather goods repair. Okay. Anything else? I think I, I think those of let we'll we'll go back to the drawing board and see if we need anything else. But, but, but having the sixty forty gives it it is accommodated. Yes, it, it would it would accommodate even if we didn't include it. That forty percent could potentially be included in there. Correct. We also have to think of what do we not want though. We don't want to open up too much. Laundromat is that allowed or not allowed? <sighs> As there. As we currently have them blocked off. In you the certainly wouldn't want a coin laundry right right in that area, right? So if they're listed similarly to a salon or other, yeah, we right need there. to find a way to. So we, we might need to redefine personal services, you think? And two, some of that, those definitions are kind of outdated. And the percentages are by parcel or is it by what? Percentage. Right now, as 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 defined, it says we're the re it's sixty percent of the linear frontage. The linear frontage of the parcel. There may be multiple parcels in each of these blocks. Correct of the parcel. Correct. Linear frontage along the street. Well, that's interesting because you've got two parcels next to each other. Uh, one person wants to be, you know, a restaurant, full mm -hmm. frontage. The other person next door, next door, uh, wants to not be an active frontage. So I mean, are we going to enforce it by parcel, or are we going to enforce it by block? It would be, some, it would be on a parcel basis. That's that's the only way we could enforce it. Right, cleaning. Right now, I think it's paired a lot with laundry. Looks like in the PDO, but 
Yeah, but the dry cleaning, it, it, you know, that people, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's an active frontage type use, even though it does get it gets a lot of activity, but of but activity. It, but it's an in and out activity. Those people are generally well. Up off and go to lunch with Julia. Just when you think you're almost. To add to the confusion, the the um, the one other thing that I asked you about is um, active frontage, particularly along uh, Magnolia. Uh -huh. uh, does the active frontage always apply to both sides of the street? It would apply. Well, it would apply to both sides of the street. But in, in this instance, if you look at right here, we're we're showing building types five, six, seven, and eight. Those are all residential, so it wouldn't apply. If active frontage is shown on both sides of the street, it just it's not going to apply to the residential because active frontage only applies to non-residential. But if we if if you think if we all think we need to just we can cut this line in half, that will, that would work too. But the only, the only How could they possibly comply uh, with the residential on that side of the street? Because active frontage doesn't apply to residential uses. Thing it wouldn't. Comply. It's just not applicable. It's not applicable. It does not, not apply. apply. Correct. I mean, we could we we could make we could change that. To, we 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 could make this red line half, you know, and cut it off on this side of the block. Okay, the only the only the only downside to that. Did I understand? If, if it doesn't apply to residential, yeah, it doesn't. Okay. It only applies to it yeah, applies to non-residential. Problem. Okay, yep. thanks. Um, in that vein, when you look at the hatching, the coloring below uh, on Magnolia, it's like the the boundary extended across some properties there. Can you see that? It's just a snapping error. Yeah, so it just needs to be edited. Yeah. We just this just came off the press late this afternoon. So. Made an adjustment. All right, so this is the so this right now would be the active frontage. That's sixty percent. Do we need to adjust that sixty percent? I know I think we need to do a little bit better at defining what active frontage is, but do we want to go back to sixty sixty forty, thinking what the right mix could be? Again, Jack, it, you're right. It is on a parcel basis. It's going because that's the only way we really can regulate. We don't want to regulate and have to run a calculation and, and run down the block and say, well, what's what are, what's an active use down here? Well, and, and it gets really hard when ownership changes and use changes. And that used to be a restaurant, but you know now only a restaurant can go in there because your neighbor next door has, exactly. you yep. know. Mm -hmm. um, the area with active frontage, to a great extent, is controlled by the parcels that will be incorporated and uh, hopefully uh, you know, consolidated by the village That's in, correct. Into, into one larger uh, block. Initially, correct. Initially, or, or village owned, more county, or et cetera. So. Correct. So the initial, the initial control, if and when we do hopefully consolidate all that, we will, you know, we'd go out for some type of RFP and we'd be, we'd be, we'd say, this is what's got to go in there. It's, it's the operating over time as things change potentially over time, 10, 15 years from now. So I, it's less, I, you're right, it's probably less of a worry right now. Um, the only other real major change that we made to this map was right here in block M. We used to just say one, but we changed that to one and two. So we added a two to, what is that? Two is office. Because that is where actually when the council sat and you know, we sat and had council discussions. There was a lot of preference to keep this as kind of off some type of some type of offices in this area versus you know allowing retail or other things up in that area. So that's all. That's all I got tonight on this stuff. I only thought it was going to last like twenty minutes, but it went longer than I thought. <laughs> that we would have been beyond our two hour. Time frame if we would have added on your other subject, I believe. So. Minor South, yes. Yeah. Well, good. So the so the, the intent is to take all this stuff and get the document into get this doc, make all the adjustments that we've talked about. With you know, we, there's still some things that we might the active frontage. I think we need to play with that a little bit. We need to look at personal services a little bit. And maybe maybe add that as a definition. But I think. Based on all of our conversations, I think we're close enough. We're, this document is almost from a, just from a guiding documents 
we're almost done with it. And it sets the stage for Pioneer South, which you know, a lot of the stuff at different setbacks and levels like that, a lot, of the, a lot of the basic requirements carry over to Pioneer South with the exception of the regulating plan. The regulating plan and lot standards. So that's, you know, that's where we spend a lot of time on and that land use table. So those three things. We're still making some adjustments based on that land, land use table that we discussed. Um, but I think we're, we're pretty good on Village Place right now. So uh, should be able to see some movement soon. So I'm happy. Good, yeah. But what's on tap for our regular meeting of January is more of this or will there be any business? Well, there'll be more of this. More of this. Uh, we're gonna, okay. I'm, I'm, we're, <laughs> I'm trying to get this document done. So hopefully, hopefully I give you a document that's, that's almost there. Um, and I think what else do we have on that meeting? For the work session. We're gonna have a work I session. Mean, work session style meeting. And then of course we have some BOA business, I believe, right? So uh, Teresa. We'll, 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 um, we'll, we'll update board of adjustment uh, sitting group that was there accordingly for that okay what else everybody that should be a, should be a good meeting be some good items coming up so, but so mainly a work session there's no there will be no action items oh, okay all right um anything else anybody any other topics we need to discuss anything from staff anybody anything from the board Go ahead, Alex. All right. So, hearing hearing nothing else discussed, we'll take a. Uh, what's that? I make a motion to adjourn the Pioneers Planning and Zoning Board meeting at uh, five forty-seven. Got it. So, I have a motion by motion yeah. made by Jack, second by Luis. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we are adjourned.